Industrial designers and architects promise modern man a life of smooth efficiency. Material progress, which has given man so many new conveniences, has at the same time speeded up the tempo of his life. But with the acceleration of his existence has come a nervous tension, which is the outstanding feature of our age. Dissatisfaction and boredom with the daily routines of life are increasingly apparent. And no matter how streamlined the design of modern living, everyday tasks in the 20th century are often regarded with distaste. In this age of tension, man is assiduous and eager in his search for relaxation. Too often unhappy with himself, he drifts into easy avenues of escape. Creatively reflecting the anxious temper of the times is modern art. An impatience with old-fashioned forms and limitations had launched the 20th century artist on a restless search for new ways of expression and for new techniques. Today's wide acceptance of modern art indicates that the public too shares that restlessness. The future role of art in a mechanized world is of deep concern to such distinguished critics as Britain's Herbert Reed. During the, the past 50 years, all the arts have had to accept the triumph of the machine. Traditional forms of painting and sculpture have no function in our streamlined existence. If they are to find a place in the civilization of the next half century, the visual arts must effect a compromise with the machine. This can be done only within the terms of what we call abstract art. But abstract painting and sculpture will hardly provide the emotional release which millions now seek at popular spectator sports. Maybe we're being uncommonly brazen or devilishly mischievous Either way, we're selling a book that, at one extreme, not even Bill Gates, the richest man in the world, can buy. But by contrast, even the most deprived among us can have at no cost. In so doing, it is our wish to convince you that art, especially art proper, is of fundamental importance to human existence and hence, at a certain level, its worth cannot be adequately determined within a capitalist medium of exchange, else it loses something essential. To establish what this thing is, we have to make an inquiry into human nature and figure out exactly what relationship art has with human reality. As we shall see, when it comes to shaping how we love, hate, and dream, art's power is second to none. It is not just a passive part of existence as, say, a stone or chair, but it is a mysterious tool which we employ to order our experience and therefore sculpt and mold reality. If we're correct, the distinction between what's real and unreal is often not a clear one, but what is experienced as real is instead mediated by products of imagination. Reality, then, is made up of the unreal. It is by being indispensable to the process of constructing reality that art acquaints us with the mystery of life and provides wondrous insight into what it means to be human. We also want to lay out and draw support for a framework that, on one hand, will allow artistic personalities to reach their full potential and, on the other, excite a love of art and beauty in the wider public. At first, what we have to say might sound like a night of dark trees, 
but if you bear with us till the end, you'll see that there are roses under our cypresses. Chicago, Illinois, a city with a thriving and busy private sector. It is home to a multiplicity of public art that probably goes unnoticed, which is understandable since life here moves so quickly that the locals may hardly be able to afford the leisure necessary to study and appreciate these cultural icons. And that's a bit sad because some of them are truly remarkable. Take this splendid monument, for example, Picasso's untitled sculpture at the Richard Daly Civic Center. Made as a gift to the city in 1967, it is an exemplary work of cubism in its use of multiple perspectives, combining frontal and profile views into a single vantage point. It explores its subject matter by letting space flow through its piercing form. In so doing, background and foreground become blended and the object itself becomes fully observable from a multitude of angles. Or in other words, there's really no wrong way to look at it. And as some historians have argued, this and similar cubist innovations might be a response to our changing experience of space, movement, and time in the modern world. A world in which the postmodern attitude is strong, wherein there is no wrong way to look at existence. Truly, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to say what art is exactly, because it can be used to label all works of imagination, and just about every sphere of human activity makes use of this faculty. Nevertheless, our favorite definition of art comes from Picasso himself, who quite simply said that art is a lie that enables us to realize the truth. And we can get a hint of what he meant by this by looking at his untitled sculpture. It doesn't tell us much explicitly, but invites us to gaze upon it, contemplate it, and incorporate it into our experience of the world. And that's the first thing we can notice about art. It's hard to define precisely, but it is instead a thousand times easier to establish its worth by talking about what it does in the life of a human being. As such, an obvious question beckons. What is it about human beings that allows art to affect us any at all? Other animals don't <laughs> listen to music, read books, or admire paintings or architecture. So what is it really about us that causes us to value works of creativity so much that we've, in some cases, turned them into multi-billion dollar industries? To answer this, we have to ask a more fundamental question. What are we? Or, more subjectively, who am I? This is also very difficult to pin down definitively, but we may be able to begin by looking at the nature of our relationship with the world. <laughs> Most of us spent our very first moments in a place like this, the Rush University Hospital. The soothing incubators, the gentle nurses, the capable doctors, the soft cotton sheets. Everything in it was designed to make us comfortable. But there's just one serious problem. 
As the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard says, none of us asked to be born, and when we arrived, someone simply slapped us on the behind and took it for granted that we wanted to stay. No one so much as bothered to say, tell us how you feel about this. Furthermore, by the time we realized that we were actually somewhere rather than nowhere, it was far too late. Our right to not be had already been long violated. There's no one we can really question or complain to either. There's no supervisor we can thank or tell that a grave mistake has been made. So here we are, alive for no particular reason, if we're being honest. Now sometimes, when some of us are in the mood for a good laugh, we'll take a few steps back and whisper exactly what we know for certain about being in the world. At the height of skepticism as espoused by Descartes, this amounts to nothing more than an I think, therefore I am. And doubting a little further, we could say we don't necessarily know who or what's doing the thinking, and that we only know there's thinking going on. Apart from this, we were afforded very little, if any, unconditional grounds for certainty. It's a discovery which led Plato to famously say, I know one thing, that I know nothing. This isn't necessarily as alienating as it sounds. In fact, coming to terms with this inescapable situation can be quite pleasing, because in a positive sense, it means we're free to explore our thoughts, even the darkest, most destitute ones, without pressure to conform to socially acceptable, totalitarian modes of thought which are, by design, limiting. Not knowing anything is the sweetest life, says Sophocles. But no matter how blissful it can be, the thinking person can't help but come to the unambiguous conclusion that human life is inherently absurd. Being conscious, self-aware beings forces us to seek after meaning and certainty in a world that can never supply us with such. We are all essentially living in what Jean-Paul Sartre calls a perpetual nothingness, a void which can never truly be filled, and at the same time, also forces us to recognize our own mortality. If taken to the extreme, how might this dizzying incredulity play out in daily living? Well, let's take something or someone recent, Donald Trump. Many on the left are certain he's an idiot. Some on the right know him to be America's last hope. Now, if people on the left wanted to be technically correct, they would say, Donald Trump behaves like someone I'd class as an idiot, but I can't go any further. I can't say for certain that he's definitively an idiot, because my definition of an idiot is conditional. The same logic would hold true for people on the right. If they're being honest, they'd say, Donald Trump says all the things I like to hear, but beyond that, I can't definitively say who he is. Hardly anyone speaks like this when it comes to these matters, however, and by extension, no one really believes or acts as if they don't know anything for certain about the world around them. It seems as if, even with the greatest effort, not even a skeptic can live in skepticism. So therefore, let us do what comes naturally and assume that our senses are correct and what we perceive to be reality is actually real. It's here that we're faced with another almighty problem, knowing how our senses map to reality. To solve this, we have to know something about ourselves as experiencing subjects. That is, we have to know how our bodies react to stimuli, and how both stimuli and the feelings they invoke are accounted for symbolically in language. Most of us develop some understanding of this at quite an early age, wherein we learn what to call painful, beautiful, real and unreal, etc. We experience as beautiful and call beautiful those things that evoke a certain emotion in us, 
and we experience and call real what we can immediately perceive with our senses. The category of unreal is given to those which we can't experience through the senses. This rudimentary understanding of reality is often enough to base a life upon, and it is here that late society often stops our education on reality. A deeper investigation, however, reveals that the separation between real experiences and unreal ones is not so easy to define past a certain point. For example, two people can look at a still pond and have completely different subjective experiences. One might see nothing more than an uninteresting body of water that doesn't deserve much attention. The other might see a beautiful natural scene that should be contemplated. Is one experience less real than the other? Are both of them fake? Or a more complicated example. People all across the world and at different times in history fell in love differently. Prior to the end of the 12th century, according to Viktor Karandashev, love was viewed in a Christian context in Europe. It was usually seen as an unselfish, harmonious, compassionate, affectionate, and benevolent relationship between people, rather than a romantic sentiment. It might include sexual attraction or not. Friendship was considered closely related to love. By the time Shakespeare came around in the 16th century, love was thought of as a consuming passion, strong illness, or powerful force that is impossible to resist. And in the 19th century, the Victorians saw romantic love as a delicate, spiritual feeling. Is one type of love less real than the other? The answer depends on your theory of love. But what accounts for this difference in experience of similar phenomena? This, we believe, is because of imagination. Nowhere is imagination shown more than in the architecture of some of the beautiful buildings in Wilmette, Illinois. The grandest of these is the Baha'i Temple, a true masterpiece of architectural innovation. It is one of the eight dedicated temples of the Baha'i faith, a religion founded in 19th century Persia, and this one is the oldest surviving Baha'i house of worship in the world. It is truly marvelous, but what exactly is this human faculty that's responsible for its arching dome, its circular layout, its heavenly decorations? What exactly is imagination? For the philosopher Immanuel Kant, this is the space between free thought and pure sensation, and also where they interact and fuse, essentially producing meaningful and concrete representations of objects or concepts in our world. It is within this faculty that our thoughts, those images, sounds, words, and sentences floating through our heads, are ordered, placed in sequence, and linked to the ebb and flow of our physiology, so that a certain thought or stream of thoughts lead to a specific neural reaction or set of reactions, and vice versa. Or, in other words, it's where our thoughts and feelings weave and intertwine. This can be referred to as our emotional matrix, and it is often pushed back into the unconscious, and from there, it runs our emotional reaction to stimuli, and hence determines how we experience the world. It is so hidden that even in present-day society, it is still rare for a person to know the real reasons behind their actions. For example, if we ask a young lady why she finds a certain young man attractive, she might say, because I get butterflies when I'm around him, not realizing that she has been conditioned since childhood through movies, etc., to imagine such a young man as attractive. For us, then, human reality is not static or independent of cognition, but is actively shaped by how symbols are organized in our imaginations, 
And this is exactly the point at which art enters the picture and proves itself to be invaluable. Art, at its highest, being an objectified and materialized product of imagination, is a technique for organizing experience and emotion. It is a way to fill the void with context. The test of an artwork is not how true to life it is, but how true life can be to it. As one of the great thinkers said, art relates to life as wine relates to the grape. With this, as Vygotsky explains, he meant to say that high art takes its material from life, but gives in return something which its material did not contain, a new way to experience phenomenon, a higher way, perhaps. Art, at its highest, then, is not only a part of reality, in some cases, it forms reality itself, instructing us on how to organize our experiences of love, hate, and desire. Doing art in this way often involves being in touch with and proud of emotions and drives that are often taboo. The more civilized the society, the more these drives are suppressed in daily living, and for good reason. For example, how many people do we know that are able to stomach the sight of lions eating people for sport in a coliseum, as the ancient Greeks did, or are so full of religious zeal that they murder in the name of heaven, as the Catholics of the 12th century, or, even more morbid, can find peace in taking their own lives publicly, as the samurai of the 17th century? No doubt, we moderns are very tame compared to our ancestors. And we have to be, in order for our way of life to function. Yes, to fit into most of our hyper-civilized societies, we have cut ourselves off from the hell within us. But in doing so, we cut ourselves off from heaven too. Because, as Nietzsche theorizes, these vital, powerful, and even dark emotions need to find expression if we're going to find the highest mode of life and culture. One essential job of the artist, then, is to make these emotions palatable, that is, to create in such a way as to foster calm in the midst of terror, to allow us to observe from the eye of the storm. Furthermore, if what we believe about emotion and experience being organized in cultural and individual imagination is true, then there can be, of course, no set, universal right way to live. Each way of life is simply a function of culture, which is nothing more than a shared mode of desiring by a group of people, of which their artists produce, to some extent, the tools and techniques of organizing experience, and thereby define the contours of their emotional world. Therefore, since our ways of life are products of imagination, they are infinite on a finite symbolic continuum. We are, as humans, incapable of imagining something we've never seen, but we can imagine all sorts of combinations of things we've seen. Thus, culture can always be reimagined infinitely within a finite range of symbols, and every generation has to take on this task for itself. To change the world, then, we simply have to change how we imagine it and our relationship to it. This has to be done experimentally, as all original works of creativity are, and it's often slow and patient work. To this end, harvest is the beginning of an experiment, the movement of some 20-somethings in search of the highest mode of living and culture. It is, for us, the foundation of a framework within which creatives can become and keep ontologically rooted in the world, and thereby solve the problem of their existence. Because human existence is a problem that must be worked out. That is, we must find out why it is that we exist. And there seems to be no manager, no higher power that can give us the answers. Such answers only seem to be revealed in the act of attentive and contemplative living. The psychologist Eric Fromm has laid out empirically that the highest mode of life has to involve love and creative work. And it's here that we'll start our experiment. For us, the first step in that direction has to be to find a way to either return art to its rightful place 
or raise it to a new one as a fixture in the daily life of people of all classes. For too long, in our view, art has been considered a fetish reserved for the idle and rich, wherein it is consumed as a commodity, and not as something that is meant to lay the sensations for change in a life, or pass on unique human experiences that can only be done through its various mediums. If we can imagine human life without music, literature, paintings, movies, although this is a relatively new art form, and agree that on the whole, human life would be astronomically poorer without them, then we should be able to agree that they should be accessible to all. And not only should they be accessible as they are on YouTube or in bookstores, but they must be features upon which culture is continually shaped and reshaped around. And the only way to do that is to have spaces where they're brought to life as having something to say about the moral and social conditions that we find ourselves in. Building more of these is one of our foremost aims. Here in Skokie, we have a park filled with sculptures. I've been here for half an hour, and no one has stopped to take an interest in them. It may be that some of the passers-by have seen them before, or it may be because they're not useful in the sense that they allow us to advance ourselves financially. Such is the state of modern life. Nevertheless, although it is apparent that the dilemma of the artist is one of ideology and cultural attitudes, what we may not be as attuned to is the current questions of scale, of access, and the impact, the width and depth of artistic production. That is to say, to raise the artist's position in society, their work needs to be disseminated to a critical mass. It must also have a profound impact on its onlookers, one that carries a personal significance, deeper than mere superficial aesthetics. The reality is that the current state of artistic production is disjointed, isolated, and far too complex to shift the fabric of society in any meaningful way. A parallel can be drawn to the state of literacy in 1439, the year prior to the invention of the printing press. Before its creation, mass communication between people was unattainable and left an essential need unmet for a social system to flourish the need to systematically circulate and exchange ideas and information. Moreover, the printing press effectively addressed the monopolization the upper class had over the truth. Both the religious and wealthy elite were held more accountable, as a consequence, to a more universally shared concept of truth. With the dissemination of literacy, what they taught the masses was scrutinized, re-examined, and left wanting. In the face of ignorance and miseducation, the printing press was a machine built to realize a universal social imperative, a quest for truth. In the same way, in the face of spiritual decay, the need emerges for the individual to have the opportunity to explore how they relate to the world and their own self-determination in a broader sense. It follows that a machine must be built to create a vehicle for existential exploration, one that may, as a result, carry the same influence on the way societies are structured, if not greater than the printing press. Not a literal, tangible machine, but instead a robust, efficient system comprised of essential component parts. Such a concept would need to first overcome two obstacles, and through these, a continuous, natural flow of many more meaningful problems will be solved. Problem 1. Lack of access. Problem 2. Lack of potency. These two, in unison, define the void between the artist and her audience. First, in terms of access, 
Since art has lost its prominence in society, it has been confined to forums and venues that are still willing to give it importance. The art gallery or niche academic schools of thought such as art history currently fill this space. In these places, the art is commoditized and put on display, deconstructed mechanically, and reduced to various exercises in objectification. Where this poses a problem for existential exploration is in the lack of important elements of contextual nuance and emotional abstraction in these forums, the experiential quality that brings the art to life. Further, given that the few dominant venues for art are long withstanding fixtures in society, the criteria they set for good artwork are not only fit for their commercial purposes, but they are enduring. These requirements are to make art marketable or educational, in other words, practical or useful, and unfortunately, good art has been reduced to those standards. In essence, burying art under pretension, which is a harmful deviation from its true power, and as a result, reducing its internal potency to the onlooker and its intrinsic fulfillment to the artist. Although one may be resigned to believe that other cases of art-centric institutions may exist or have emerged, ones that allow higher levels of artistic integrity, what is clear is that they are too niche or too inaccessible to meet the needs of a large amount of people. Both of these problems, if solved in a simple, sustainable way, would serve to uproot and reshape the application of art. Crucially, the residual benefits of this solution would extend to both the artist and her audience. The only way to accommodate a shift of that magnitude would require a system that streamlined and unified the creative process at scale. One that could churn out creative production of the highest level. A machine. To be sure, the smallest gift given with life and vigor is teleologically priceless. And since art at its purest is a gift of being, it is, to this degree, priceless. What exactly do we mean by priceless? Well, in contemporary society, it is the market that dictates the price of an item which rises or falls in relation to supply and demand. The price one pays for an item is assumed to be what it is worth at the time of the exchange. But there are certain things that can't simply be sold based on their market value. And any attempt to do so without realizing that these things possess something which can never be bought or sold will leave much lacking after their sale. That is, these things must necessarily lie beyond market control, lest they become corrupted. For example, the ideal of motherly love would be harmed if a mother had to be paid in order to love her child. If money meant more motherly love, or conversely, if no money meant no love, then we'd probably become disinterested in such a transaction. This is so because, for many of us, there's something intrinsically valuable in the love of a mother for her child. Such a relationship has something or things that simply can't be measured monetarily. What is this thing, or things, exactly? It would seem probable that it's more than one thing, of which the unifying theme behind them, in our eyes, is that they allow our human powers to unfold. So, essentially, if what we hold to be true, that human life is priceless, then the things that allow us to grow and deepen our experience of life are priceless as well. Art especially art proper, as we have explained, is no doubt one such thing. It promotes social solidarity, intellectual and spiritual enlightenment. Therefore, the market shouldn't and cannot determine its worth. Nevertheless, in a society where we often pay more attention to the material than the spiritual, and to the loud rather than the soft, it is perhaps naive of us to try and spread a love of the beautiful and humble. We might be even more naive to fight against the idea that everything should be for financial merit. 
It's as if we're a small dog, barking at a mighty, all-encompassing avalanche. But bark we must. And selling a simple book for $87.5 billion is perhaps the loudest bark we can make.